welcome back to night three of 13 Nights of Tiki Frights. My name's Gabe, and I'm from the Search for Tiki. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Our cocktail was put together by Easy Tiki Drinks. It's called the Flock of Crows, and it's a riff of a jungle bird. The recipe is on our website, 13nightsoftikifrights.com. Check it out. Our event is sponsored by Plantation Rum. So, of course, our cocktail does use Plantation Rum. And uh, I also want to say that we are having an in-person Halloween celebration at Wusong Road uh, in Cambridge, Mass. To celebrate the end of 13 Nights of Tiki Frights on Halloween. So on October 31st. It is almost sold out. Tickets are on our uh, on the website, NewEnglandTikiSociety.com. So if you plan on attending our in-person event, now's the time to get tickets. There will be no wait list. And with that said, I'm super excited to talk to uh, Ken Ruzik and Nerd Out. Ken's been a part of the Tiki scene for a long time, and he's our special guest tonight. So without further ado, let's bring in Ken. Hey, how are you, man? Hey, what's up, buddy? Yeah. <laughs> what was that? Oh, I, I got these sound effects. I did an interview years ago with Ray Boylan, and I found this website where I can do different ones. So, you know, if things start getting boring, we can just go. Do uh, some sound effects? Yeah, we can just do some sound effects, you know. <laughs> the cricket stirping. <laughs> or something, you know. Do you have the drum? Are you ready for, are you ready for, for, your... are you ready for tonight? Uh, I'm ready. Are you ready? I think I'm ready. Uh, well, you know what? I don't really know. I probably should bring some more. All right. Cheers, buddy. So you had a good day today or what? Yeah. Thanks for coming on. You uh, So we, the past couple guests are relatively new in Tiki. You've been doing Tiki a long time, so I'm super excited to talk to you, not just because of that, but also because I've had your art on my walls for a long time, and I've never actually got to like sit down and chat with you. Oh, well, thank you. So now I get to pick your brain about all the pieces I've, I've purchased selfishly. <laughs> Yeah, people will come up to me and they'll say, hey, yeah, I love this this piece of yours I've had for years. It's on my wall. I'm like, well, what's the name of it? And they draw a blank. And then I go, well, you know, what what's it about? And they're like, well, it's blue. You know, and so blue. <laughs> it's I, got some tiki's oh, in it. So frustrating. Yeah, because it's like I can't explain it if I don't know what it is. But geometric yeah. shape. So what do you have? A blue one? A blue one? Oh, I got yeah. a yellow one. I got a, a green and blue one. <laughs> wow. Okay. No, I'll show you one of them. Let's so see. Got, so I got this one. Oh yeah. Right. I, I don't know what color is this, Ken. Oh, a lot. Most I'd say yellow because that's the first thing that hits. That was for our gargantuan show last year. We had to do um, ones based on music, and I'm not that much of a pop culture guy, so I just decided I'd use a song title and go with there. And I went with Crocodile Rock, and so I did a <laughs> little piece uh, kind of reflecting. Uh, just the title, not even the song. So, how do you so like? A lot of your pieces have narrative in them, right? Yeah. Do you sit down with the narrative, or or is it kind of just like see what happens? Either or. Either you know, or. I, I yeah, in my in my sketchbooks, I'll just uh, write down a, a a ton of just different ideas, for pieces, little little adventures, little you know little ways I can get high art um, subjects or feelings into like, you know, this little kitschy thing we have, you know? So yeah, that, or sometimes just when I'm making it, sometimes when I'm, I'm, I'm making it, I'll just, um, a story will start to form, you know? I'll start with a boat or a path or, uh, you know, a waterfall. And then all of a sudden, you know, cause half the pieces are involve a lot of studies and whatnot. And other ones are just play, you know, you have to yeah. reward yourself. Um, so. It's, it's, it's so interesting to me, and um, I don't know how you do this. Um, I think it's one of the most perhaps impressive thing an artist can do is have a distinct style, right? Like if I see a, a picture on, on a, a wall in someone's home tiki bar that you did, I'm like, that's a, that's a Ken Ruzik, right? I can tell that right away. And at the same time, like all the things that you're depicting, the tikis and whatnot, are very... Um, even though they're in your style, they're very true oftentimes. So like oceanic art in Polynesia, like I can say, oh, that's a cool tiki. Oh, that's from Papua New Guinea. Is there like a trick to like keeping things in your style and also being recognizable? Or is that something well, that just- Well, it is um, wanting to um, kind of be able to still communicate what, what part of Polynesia that, that piece is from or that character is from but still get a play on it and throw it into like Kenland, you know? 
So, um, I don't know. I can't explain it. It just, it just happens. Just happens. <laughs> just happens. Where do you, okay, well, let's, let's do this. Where do you, so like, how do you, what's your strategy for researching? Like, do you do a lot of traveling? Is it mostly online? Um, mostly, um, in my library. Uh, let me see if I can show you. Yeah. Here's just a part of it. <laughs> it just keeps on going and going. Ah, you got all the good books. Yeah. Well, I decided a <laughs> long time ago, um, when I, when I was doing my research that everybody was going to the same well, they were all going to google.com, Google images and whatnot, you know, just a lazy thing to do. And I'm, I'm never that lazy. So I decided just, why not start my own library so I can initially start with references that are, you know, that aren't on Google or might be on page 34, you know? Yep. And so, you know, it was kind of fun because it kept me sheltered from um, what the status quo is thinking concerning that image, you know? So that was kind of fun too. That was a nice opportunity to stay individual and, and stuff. It's kind of interesting. It. There's this, this idea that, you know, like any, anything you want to know is available on Google, right? Yeah. And uh, everyone can get all their answers from Google. But specifically, I I like I've kind of discovered with Tiki that that is oftentimes not true. Oh, true. There's tons of information on Google. And yet when you go to research a bar that like went extinct. It's, it's like next to impossible sometimes. Yeah. I don't know how Sven. I think he calls it urban archaeology. Yeah, you got a whole family of them out there, you know. Yeah, <laughs> hunting down there. stuff. And everybody knows, and we're such a community. If somebody says, you know, hey, I went to a garage sale, or hey, I went to my um, auntie's attic, you know, and they'll find these wonderful things and then just share them online, you know. There's people who take all that and just, you know, compile it. You just have to go around looking online for it sometimes. But, yeah, there's still little treasures out there, though, and I like to keep them in the library, and that way I can just kind of refer and, do some studies, you know, that aren't from stuff that someone else is already doing or playing with and stuff. Yep. I also love how a lot of your work, and this goes through uh, with some of the other gargantuas, which we'll talk about probably later, but um, you kind of incorporate stuff that's not oceanic sometimes mm -hmm. from like other cultures, mythology and stuff. Um, yeah. Do I have you a have like a, Go ahead. do you have like a classic art background? Um, a classic art love background. Classic art love. <laughs> okay. You know, where, where I just go and educate myself. Like when I was little, I think one of my earliest reports for a school was in like sixth grade and it was like Norse mythology and I was really into it. And I had found this husband and wife team who did lithographs. I heard, what was their names? D'Audelaire? Was that them? I think they might be called D'Audelaire. This husband and wife team that would do these beautiful little lithographs. And from there, I just loved that and always been fascinated with mythologies of, of the world with um just society in general because we're such a weird species if you really step <laughs> and look at it you know it's really interesting and so there's plenty of things to reflect on and there's plenty of things in fine art i found as i grew as an artist that artists had had questioned artists had started to try and display or share you know that that common feeling we all have and so sometimes the work will go off in different avenues you know, Tiki happens to be the one where I, I sell the most um, that I still enjoy after 30 some years. I still I still enjoy playing with that. And but there's still other older um, subject matter and stuff like that. I work with that's just really kind of weird and conspiracy theory meets mythology and all <laughs> weird kind of fun things that I, that I like to revive every once in a while. You know, it's just part of being an artist. You know, you don't want to be a one trick pony. Having dug into it uh, for as long as you have, ha ha like Tiki is often branded as being exotic, right? And that's the allure, like it's an exotic thing because it was different from what we were used to. But when you look at it and you study like other mythologies, Norse mythology, Greek mythology, all that stuff, like that's kind of exotic too. Like if, if you yeah. weren't familiar with that, do you still find after all these years that like exotic, it feels exotic to you? Or is it just like commonplace now? Like this is, yeah, this yeah. is normal. No, it's still, there's still a, a real sense of discovery and some of that when you find a, like an old PNG folktales book at the thrift store or something, you know, and you start to read it and stuff. There was one about some lady I, I did a painting of years ago. There was a woman in the village and flooding happened in the village and she was hoarding food for her and her children and not sharing, you know, doing a community thing with the village and stuff like that. 
but no one knew it was her. They just, you know, um, so a hunter was out in the jungle one day and he sees this lady. And what happens is she has this ability. It was somehow granted to her from a bird. And so she would remove her head and put it over, hide it in the bushes and assume this bird head and jump in the water and be able to, it was like one of the, like a kingfisher, a, a Polynesian kingfisher, let's say. Okay. <laughs> you know, they swim down in there and catch, catch a fish and whatnot and then come back up. And that's how she would feed her family and stuff. And this warrior saw that and stole her head. And so the curse is, and there's um, different sculptures of it you can see elsewhere, are just her with her bird head and her two children and stuff. But it was like this penalty for not contributing to uh, the society, you know. I mean, most folk tales are that, you know. They're, they're meant as lessons for that culture. You know, way Little Aesop fable kind of things. Yeah, well, it's that whole common uh, societal courtesy. You know, if if you all have a common base of 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 rules or beliefs, then it you know it makes it easier. And I think those folk tales were meant to reflect that for that village life. You know, that that's that's what helped it work, I guess, or something. But yeah, there's some really cool different ones. Like lots of ghost ones, some ghost ones, PNG ones are scary, like Caves of the Skulls, you know, just oh, the really? type. I don't know anything about those. Oh, I mean, I, like, so I've been to Hawaii, so I know that, like, there are the the cliffs, right? Uh, Kil Kil Kilauea Cliffs? Oh, is that the they, night? they put, like, the, the bones and, like, as a sacred place, you don't touch it. Is that what you're oh, talking yeah. about, or are you talking about something different? No, no, no. They treat their, um, their burials differently in Hawaii than they do in Papua New Guinea. There's just different, they'll, they'll throw theirs in caves. There's also the Aseki tribe who um, they'll um, basically smoke the bodies of their chiefs. They'll bind them and they'll smoke them like jerky and stuff. And they'll turn this bright red. Okay. <laughs> Is that an Aesop fable or something? No, no, that's not Just a little footnote. <laughs> yeah, a kidney yeah, footnote. I, <laughs> well, I had to do a mug around that theme with uh, the Inferno Room guys. And so, uh, oh, I can actually hear. We'll start some pictures. Uh, start some Inferno pictures. Okay. Room. I think it might be uh, U4. Try that. Is that the red skull uh, mug? Yep. Uh, throw it on. How fun. Oh, and hi, everybody in the comments. <laughs> Yeah, see how it's that, that red color up at the yep. top? Yeah, that was caused by when they smoke the bodies um, in these little houses and stuff. And then they bring them out for ceremony and it just preserves them. You know? Or if someone gets hungry, wants a snack. <laughs> oh so what? So they they smoke them, they preserve them, then what do they, do you know what they do with it's them after They turn this color red. And so... Uh, that's why we did it that red. I don't know. That was kind of an offshoot from the folklore thing, but that's okay. Well, what do you want to talk about um, that I have pictures for? Do you want to want to look at some paintings or you want to talk sure. about some new mugs? What are you into? Let's uh, let's start with some paintings. Okay, there we go. That's one. That's on something uh, called Black Suede Velvet. And I'll sh I do have a tutorial for you I can show you guys in a minute. Okay, let's do the next one, B. That one's called a baby cannibal king. He's like little and stuff. <laughs> but if you go to C, oh no, or C1, I'm sorry, C1, whoops. No, that's not it either. No. Oh, well. Anyway, it was, oh, I didn't put it in there. It must have got yeah. lost. Anyway, it's, U, it's UV uh, activated. So anyway. Oh, okay, so, so you put yeah, the black lights. Now, is, is that paint harder to work with? Um, no, no, it's the, you can get acrylics in any, any tone. Um, the surface is black suede matte board, which is actually like matte board you use, you know, they would, they would do something called tipping of a piece where you put like a drawing on top of it. And it's like this nice velvety background and stuff, but I didn't like a velvet that much, uh, velvet bows. It's merciless. Um, you have to do layers, 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 layers. And this has the same applications and parts where you can use, um, Brush strokes in one direction that helps a lot of times with velvet and it also helps with this stuff and you just build up colors you just lightly go and um you know you just use lightly lightly do layers over it and then you keep on adding and adding and adding and it gets darker and darker and darker the trick is weird is uh working backwards from 
shadows to the brightest areas. Okay. It's a, it's a brain blender, man, you know, because you're used to starting with a white or at least a lightly colored piece of paper and then going darker from there. So all of a yeah. sudden you got to rearrange your brain. So I've been having fun with these uh, the past few years, you know, just kind of retraining my brain, um, getting that sense of uh, maybe you'll fail at it kind of thing. You know, that, <laughs> that you rarely get after like 30 years of doing it. You know, you don't get that that often. You think, okay, this is 90% is going to turn out okay. You know, so. do you find, um, and this is something that I personally struggle with sometimes in, in the mugs that I want to make, uh -huh. that, um, sometimes the mugs that I want to make are not necessarily the mugs that are going to sell. Yeah. So there's always that, you know, that financial aspect of being an artist, like the stuff you want to make is not necessarily for the mainstream. Do you, how do you balance that? between like being a successful artist financially and doing what, you know, interests you. Yeah. When I used to do design and uh, design work and surfwear stuff, um, it was easy because I would go to work and I would be creative all day and draw just a little bit. And then boom, I would go home and, and you know, you'd already be bubbling. Your brain would already be bubbling, you know, because you had been working all day and already creative. And so I would just work on stuff then. Back then, I really didn't even give any matter to the audience. It was just mostly um, I had to get it out, just biologically, and um, and you know, so I was just doing stuff and playing and whatnot like that. And then um, just you know, going from uh, tiki to the other you know the other subject matters and stuff like that. So I don't know. Lately, since uh, COVID, though, I've had to do it um, just as a living, and so there's. I, I, I don't like to rely on pop culture um, references for sales. I'd rather still do what I'm doing, but I'm paying more attention now. Um, thanks to hanging out with Doug and uh, Big Toe, because those are business guys. You know, I'm nothing at all like that. The other gargantuas. But, yeah, but I found out that, you know, you can do themes. You know, you can carry a theme that's popular. You don't have to necessarily... Um, you know, just do one piece in that theme. You can explore it further, you, you know, like um, like the, like the boats, you know, you can put two characters in there, three characters, and you can come up with so many different uh, scenarios. You know? Is that kind of how, like, the Gargantua started? Because you kind of do, like, themed oh, art exhibits? Was. Well, here, I'm going to have you share one of our flyers. The Gargantua, we started about 10 years ago, and it was Tom and I, and what we wanted to do was we wanted to kind of still do tiki, but you know we had done it for four or five, six years already, and so we wanted to kind of still show that we were also fine artists too. You know, it's like a more of a, a take us seriously kind of thing, or, or you know, a lot of it was um, myself wanting to um, just uh, do stuff besides tiki to go and explore different themes and, and just to kind of show people that we can do that too, you know, that our brains aren't just locked in one place. And so I'm always in charge of doing the flyers and this, these are for Australia and these are hilarious. We called it a uh, low down, throw down, down under, I think we called it some, some shit like that. But we got to go to the custom lane gallery in Melbourne and have a show, but I was hyping it a lot with these different flyers and that bear in the background. If you look at that bear, yeah, that's from, one of those, <laughs> okay. that's from one of those old school Aurora model kits they used to have. They used to have like all these different dinosaurs and cavemen and an actual cave. And I remember going to visit my grandma Ellen and so we would go downstairs and there was a shoe store. So we'd get a pair of shoes and then we'd go next door and there was this toy store. And I would always get one of these models and I got, I used to have that bear. Yeah, that one's good. At the top. So when you're doing these advertisements for the gargantuas, are you just finding pictures of the, your friends in these poses or are you oh, sending them have, like instructions? Files <laughs> on everybody. Like the, we're like this year or next year, we're going to be um, having a show with Jim Owen. And so um, I've already started collecting stuff with him. I'm trying to find a, a picture of him without a hat though, because you know, I might put him in space and you know, I'll have to fucking create a bubble, you know, with him and his hat. So yeah, I, I collect pictures of all of our artists and stuff. And you know, there's always embarrassing ones. There's some great ones where Doug looks really mad, but he's not, you know, and it just, you know. I, so I'm just imagining like 
like we get the 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 clean ones right and i feel like you're making ones that you're facilitating in the group that perhaps we don't see that are just funny no i ain't got time i got, pain. got the time. okay that's fair yeah i'll do like price of anywhere between uh two to six or seven flyers it just depends but my australia ones are my crowning achievement um show that one that looks like a video cassette cover I'm not proud much, but I'm very proud of the flyer <laughs> for some stupid reason. Yeah, check it out. Ah. <laughs> yeah. the, the verbiage on it. Here, I'll read it to you. Another exciting adventure from Video Gold's library of action-packed mayhem. The action and explosive intes intensity of Custom Tiki Kill Kill, that was the name of our show, will make this film an important addition to the collection of any serious student of bad artist action films. The story surrounds the life and death struggle of three washed up artists as they stumble into the dark world of rival gangs and hired killers of Australia. Their conflicts take them from the laid back shores of Southern California to the exotic nightclubs and rugged terrain of Melbourne and their continuing quest for total glory. All this intrigue and murder can only lead to tragedy. Can these three survive? How awesome is that? And then I got a little logo that says fair dinkum. Because that means like, all right, in Australian. This little right here. Yeah, be fair dinkum. <laughs> Who is this guy? <laughs> <laughs> That's Barney. He's the owner of the Custom Lane Gallery. So Okay. <laughs> I had all the artists on there, and they were kind enough to sponsor us and everything. I figured we'd go. Look, it's, it's Dirty Digger, Doug Horn, Bonzo Bloke, Big Toe. And then I got some name down there, too. But we're well armed. Oh, Ken the Kill Mad Canuck. Rowdy Ratbags Agro Australia. Opening That's reception. Cool. What year was this? This was um... oh, I don't know. Four or five years ago. But that was a flight, man. Oh geez. There weren't enough I've got a, um, for a flight like that, you know? I've run out of my flock of crows, so I'm gonna make another mug. Another another drink. I got right. my legendary realms bowl. <laughs> yeah. I have a custom painted one, the only one in the world, on sale on my Etsy store. Oh really? Yeah, look, I did shameless plug page. Shameless, shameless plug, plug page. page. <laughs> <laughs> oh, take a screenshot. There you go. There you yeah, go, guys. If you want this was this was one of my grails. So I got into Tiki just a few years ago. And this had long sold out, or I don't know if I had long sold out, but it had sold out by the time I got into Tiki. And then I really fell in love with your art and uh, Tom Big Toe Laura's and Doug Horns. And so this was a grail, and I finally picked it up. Um, Legendary Realms. And I think you were with uh, Atomic Kitty this year. Yep, we were with Susie. She's the Marquesan in your left hand. So each design. So this is yours, right? Yep. This is the king. And then this is. That's Atomic Kitty. I don't know. I then... oh, no, Susie was the Moai. I'm sorry. Doug was the Marquesan. Whoops. Okay, yeah. Okay, so. This is Doug Horn. Yeah, and then, really uh, open this was Susie. With a little Wario necklace. That's so rad. And then, and Tom, then Tom did, did double eyes on him, like Alfred Backer. Mm -hmm. He did a little warthog with the different eyes, and then I had one with a uh, with four eyes on it too. We is, this, is this the first like collaborative bowl you worked on? Yeah. Yep. And then we did uh, um, Night Marchers Bowl. This one right here. Ooh, is that a custom painted one by by Kenny? Yeah, check this out. Right here, does it do it? Ooh. Uh, no, that one doesn't do it. Here, I'll get, I'll get the one that does. It's right here. Guys, I'm gonna make a cocktail real quick. I know that we do all these fancy cocktails on the show, and I love fancy cocktails. But I also, uh, for my for my team of uh, fellow friends on Wu Song Wednesday. They know I usually have a couple cocktails and then I switch to a glorious Coca Cola. Oh, like whiskey and Coke or something? That's <laughs> so we'll do plantation and Coke. Oh, nice. That's good. That plantation is really good. Okay, yeah, check it out here. Ready? Look at them eyes. They just glow. Like, oh, the top glows. So, what's your process for painting mugs? Like, uh, as Faust would say, vandalizing. If it's a bisque, um, you can just paint it with acrylic. Sometimes I'll have artists, if I do collabs with them or something, um, 
they'll give me ones that are bisque on the outside, but glazed on the inside. So you can still drink it and I can work with acrylic on it. Usually I'll work with um, enamels, like alpha enamels are really good. I used to use one shot, but that was merciless. It's like painting with freaking toothpaste. But um, alpha enamels are good. They're nice and smooth. And, uh, and I love they have a little steel uh, bearing in the bottle. So I'll just shake it and listen to it sometimes when I'm, you know, sad. <laughs> <laughs> That's how you cheer yourself up? You used to have, yeah, that and the pooter. <laughs> you know what this is? No. The pooter tutor. <laughs> what? Thor, Thor introduced me to this when we used to vend in the suite at Old Oasis's. But you lick your hand. And then you can. See? I don't think I've had. I, I don't think I've had enough to drink yet, Ken. <laughs> Wait, ready? Shh. Ready? Listen. <laughs> so it sounds like a little fart, right? And so um, I would. People would go into the booth, and I would just, you know, I'd bend over and bust one out, and, and it was just the funnest thing ever, man. So you, I can get off my list. Ended with um. Thor and Crazy Al, right? Thor, Crazy Al, and then we added Doug on there too at the sweets. The sweets were great, man. And I found I found the perfect uh, trick uh, for that. What what I do is um, before I unload all my stuff, I'll say that we have a baby in the room and that we'd like a um, a baby cart, you know, a baby a baby bed. No, bring me the baby bed. I take all the shit out of it, all the bottom stuff. I check it out to my car and I, I could unload in like two loads. And then I just keep that there. And then at the end of uh, on, on Sunday, I just use that same baby car and just load back up in two loads and I'm out of there. Genius. Yeah, awesome. <laughs> the tricks of the trade. I tell you, man. Everyone's going to start, you know, asking for baby carts and now they're yeah. going to run out and they're going to know. Well, you mentioned you. Um, yesterday. I remember listening, um, and you said something about a garish, uh, or you know, garnish. I'm sorry, not a garish, but a garnish on drinks. The dehydrated the only, fruit. The only drink I think that rates a garnish. The other ones you can add and stuff, but the one that necessarily needs a garnish is a Bloody Mary, because you have the celery and all that stuff on there. That's you fair. know, it's half of an eating thing, you know. But all the other ones are just you know, kind of copycats. You know, they're posers. You know. Yeah, come to think of it, I don't think a Bloody Mary would be a Bloody Mary if it didn't have a garnish. No kidding. It just wouldn't make oh, sense. I had the shittiest, I had the shittiest uh, freaking uh, whiskey and coke at the airport in Illinois. I'm not going to name the city. When I was, how do you make a bad whiskey and coke? <laughs> oh yeah, my sister and I get there and we're making fun of the people in line for the security and stuff. We're like, we need a drink, man, before we, you know, before before I say goodbye to her and stuff. So we go to this bar and there's a guy there. It's his first day. And I just say, I'd like a whiskey and Coke. And he's like, well, we don't have any Coke. We just have Pepsi. So he fucking gets the Pepsi out of the can, pours that in with the whiskey. And so I had to have this crappy ass drink. So I had two. We made fun of the people. So that's a Is great. Is that the worst cocktail you've ever had? Yeah, probably. Oh. <laughs> probably. Probably. Yeah, I've had some pretty, pretty bad cocktails in my life. Hello, everybody. Hi, Roxanne. I see her with screaming pooter tutor. I see. <laughs> Hi, Tom. Hi, RJ. Oh, speaking of what we're talking about stuff before we just blab away, I have some friends and some projects I'd like to share with everybody. Okay. Is that okay? Sounds is, good is to that, me. Is that me taking over the show? Am I, am I, am I being alpha interviewee? <laughs> That's it. We're going to get rid of Ken, guys. You know, he. He has used all, all of his time. Well, you're probably far more interesting. <laughs> you probably so what do you want me to show? Give me your. Uh, let me see here. Let's start with uh, some projects I'm doing right now. I'm working with some wonderful people. Oh, here. We'll do a project I did from last year. Zero, or no, O, O1, and O2. Let's, uh, let's just show those quickly. I did a big mural at Wilfrid's, and there's some uh, car salesman. <laughs> Who is this degenerate in this picture? Why is he here? Some car salesman, drunken guy. I mean, maybe he was a street preacher. I'm not sure. But he took a picture in front of my huge mural. Look, I did a huge mural last year. I wouldn't take any religious advice from that preacher. <laughs> no, I wouldn't buy a car from him or nothing. No. I might buy him a drink just to get him out of my face. 
Yeah. Is that the, the first giant mural you've done or you do a lot of murals? Uh, we did one for the Bamboo Club. I had done a 7 by 15 foot one in front of the Ronald Reagan courthouse back in the 90s, but it was taken down. It was um, the apotheosis of the city dreaming of art. It was really a trippy little video. But yeah, there's Tom. So let me show you the artwork for it. This is actually a good story. Uh, Flora was uh, originally, she's the one in the boat. Yeah, this is the study for it. You can show the other one. The, the other one is the final story. But yeah, see, she's kind of blurry. But the other one is not blurry. What's the other one? There's one more. Zero. One more. Go back one. That one right there. Yeah, that's the actual art for the piece. But Flora right there, she's a, she was born in Hawaii um, and basically moved out, got married, moved back here to Napa with her husband. They bought a ghost winery and they started... Um, Florida Springs Winery. And so that's what got the whole Wilfred's thing going and stuff like that. So I sent them about seven or eight concepts and they loved this one. The idea of her coming from Hawaii, you know, down through the, I think this is the uh, bridge on first street. And I tried to um, base it on the one that was uh, existing when they first got there back in the twenties or thirties or something. Yeah, it's the Combs family. They were wonderful, wonderful people. And it was such a fun job. And I didn't want to paint it there because I knew it would take me a month. And I didn't want to be away from my cat for that long. <laughs> so um, I basically said, hey, can I just, you know, make the panels here and you guys assemble them? And they said, sure. And so I was 24-7 rolling out of bed at 3 o'clock in the morning working on it. Um, How it was long did it take you to do? The, um, took about a month. And then uh, they they picked it up and delivered it and assembled it on the wall and stuff. But it was really strange doing it because you had to grid the whole thing out. And when you were working on the piece, it was only um, – it was since it was 14 feet tall and 40 feet wide, I was doing them um, seven by uh, four. And so we did like 20 panels. and But they were looking very abstract in some parts. I didn't even know where I was. I had to constantly keep my reference there and make sure, you know, Despite the fact that it's a fairly simple drawing, it's, it's, you know, it got really involved when you close up on it and get in all the lighting and stuff. Yeah. But it was really fun. I'd love to do another one. And in fact, in December, Doug, Ooh. Tom and I are going to be painting a mural together. A gargantua all, mural? That's all I can reveal for now, I think. Ah. Yeah, that's okay. The plot thickens. December's hey, not that far. Here's a question for you. So you you do a lot of tiki's in your art. Um, this this one kind of looks like a would that be a lono to me? Yes, that'd be a lono. Um, do you have like reoccurring characters in in your paintings, or is like each one kind of its own separate thing? No, I have reoccurring characters. Um, I'll have a cannibal king. I'll sometimes I don't even give them names. I just kind of know them by look. Like you know, there's the chubby Moai guy, or there's the Arango, you know, and. Um, I don't know. Sometimes I'll sometimes I'll carry themes on. Just sometimes I'll end up on mugs and stuff. I'm sorry. I'm wiping my table because I uh, spilled my Kurakawa, and that. Oh no! Three. <laughs> it's it's like it would be like uh, spilling a soda. So, but yeah, I would just have different characters, and sometimes I, I like little characters. I have a little lost Tiki. I was I I started this whole thing um, trying to do a kids book. And it just ended up, okay, I'm going to do an illustration for this this part of the story, this part of the story. And all of a sudden, it just turned into a shit ton of paintings and no story. you know. So I have like partial parts of the story written, but I don't have anything complete, and I just have a lot of paintings. So um, I may actually buckle down. Is it still in the works? Yeah. Still in the works. Do you? Oh, so um, like when you do uh, these characters. Canadian. What? I'm sorry. I'm, I'm, I was answering some of uh, Tom's uh, comments. Tom, ignore Tom. Tom just Tom ruins everything. He's trying to push his chip <laughs> for the gargantuas nine. He wants to call it Escape from the Island of the Battle of the Thunderdome. He's really into Thunderdome. <laughs> and when I showed him some of the paints I had available for this mural project we're doing, he just latched on to uh, Mars Yellow, like a like an like a like a ADHD guy or something. He was just like really into Mars Yellow, Mars Yellow, Mars Yellow. So <laughs> Like a broken record. <laughs> so what maybe, is, oh, go ahead. What is your, so like Gargantua always has a theme. What is your like brainstorming process with uh, Doug and Tom? Uh, well, first we'll decide on um, an artist. 
And then what we do is we basically all think of uh, 12 to 20 titles or just different stuff to, um, to be taglines, you know, like, uh, you know, blood sport for the behemoths, you know, you know, some of the, <laughs> you know, we'll just think of that and we'll base some of it on old exploitation movie titles. Other times we'll do, um, just make up titles, comic book titles. Um, you know, there's so many different resources. You go to old pulp uh, magazines, you can find great titles to riff on and variations on. And sometimes we'll pick like a space theme. Sometimes we'll pick like a, uh, like last one was based around, you know, Sinbad and the Eye of the Tiger kind of, kind of graphics and stuff like that, old sword and sandals kind of stuff. So it just depends, but the flyers don't necessarily, um, they don't necessarily drive our subject matter, but they're just okay. kind of me having fun and, you know, playing with the title and these flyers and stuff and just, you know, putting our heads on goofy bodies. And <laughs> but, um, yeah, and then what we do is we pick out about um, – we, we go through and we each um, have a list of categories, and we all vote on those. And then we figure out, you know, this one got four votes from all four of us, so this one's definitely in as a category. And this one only got two votes, so we're going to ax that and vote on these ones. And we'll have categories all the way from – let's see. We've had, like, um, cryptozoology was one, a Polynesian myth, uh, classic monsters – you know, where Tom did um, Frankenstein. I think Doug did Frankenstein, too. And then I did uh, on Dr. Moreau, the leopard man, when he takes that sip of water and gets discovered and realizes he's breaking the rules. Yeah, I love that part of the book. But anyway, we'll, we'll go over and we'll vote on the categories. And then um, then we get a thing called a wild card, where we put all of our names okay. in a little, little smelly hat. Then we draw out a name, and whoever gets that gets to pick out a subject that it could be anything. It could be like portraits of my bottom. You know, it could be anything, anything you want. So I've got these guys to do self portraits one year. That was really fun. Um, still life. Whenever I get a, um, a, a wild card, I'll always try and go for a fine art theme, but we've had themes like Sid and Marty Croft was one of them. Um, oh shoot. What was some of the other ones we did? Like sometimes it'll be like pinup girls or something like that, you know? So it's kind of fun because we're all throwing a little bit of our personal aesthetics and, and favorite subject matter in there. But then we're also thinking of our, our art brothers, you know, what would be fun to see Doug do, you know, a comic book cover or, you know, something like that. So that's how we kind of did it. And it just kind of took off from there, but it's just mostly started to get us out of Tiki, you know, a little bit, you know, to let us, let us push our boundaries to go outside the yard a little bit, you know, and play out in the street. I think that's when it gets really fun is when you take a couple different things and you smash them together. Yeah. And that's when you get that really original stuff. You mentioned putting in like still life. Okay. So, so someone's putting in like my bottom and you're putting in still life. Mm -hmm. um, would well, you, so like your art in a lot of ways, it, it, it it's two things simultaneously or I would say it's two things simultaneously where it's very like the highbrow Polynesian, like this is legitimate oceanic style art. And then it's also got that lowbrow element. When you think about your art, do you think of it more as the lowbrow side or more of the classically trained oceanic stuff? Um, I don't know. Cause the, all the Polynesian old masters are, are in a league by themselves. You know, that's what drew me to Polynesian art is the fact that, they could make something that is so, you know, semi cartoony, but also is just filled with just this power and, and symbolism and, and stuff, you know? And so I've always liked that and always admired that because that's no art school training. That's just what we have right here, you know, and right here where we're, what we're born with, everyone's born with that, you know, it just depends on where you live and how you react to the surroundings around you. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a jungle out there. So there's, there, there's a different kind of thought than if you if you grew up in an urban area and stuff. And so you get these wonderful art forms. And the Sepik River in Papua New Guinea, you know, there's all these different tribes. You know, and some of them are our friends and some aren't. But you can see different variations of all the different art. You can see brand new stuff over here, but then you can see it over here where, where maybe someone saw it and decided to use that as a motif. And so it's like a, a riff on, on that, that kind of incorporating different styles. And it's kind of neat. It's like, it's how, you know, in Europe during maybe the, 
uh, late 1800s and the 20s, how art evolved. You know, it wasn't so social media fast. It had to like grow organically. You know, all of a sudden, someone, all of a sudden, Japan was selling a lot of prints that happened to hit by boat in France. And all of a sudden, all the artists are looking at these going, these are graphic marvels that need to be explored within a fine art context. You know, that's how you got Gauguin and Van Gogh and all those artists kind of, kind of playing with that. I don't know if I answered your question or just. No, you did. I, I love this idea of, um, or at least most of my favorite artists are the people that are able to take like the high art and then bring it down to a lower level without sacrificing, like, I guess the integrity of the art or the purpose or the meaning behind it. And yeah, I, I think that's why your art speaks to me a lot is because it's, it's, uh, it's approachable, I would say, but at the same time, like there's a lot of different layers behind it. Yeah. Well, that's for different kinds of people. Some people just glance at a piece for 10 seconds and they leave. Other people sit down and look at a piece. You know, it just, it just depends. And especially for people who buy a piece, you want them to have, you want them to have more from it. You want them to have a story from it and stuff. Oh, here, look at number J. That's a, that's a men's hut study I had done. Um, that's just kind of a little bit of a riff right there. Where it's a little bit of a riff with, with the, with the kind of spiritual and ghostly manner of, of the men's hut with the, hut, with the kind of tree kind of, transparently growing through it and stuff but you know that's not actually an accurate one but i had looked at a few of the men's huts to make it accurate so is this one of the like the huts that are like considered sacred like you couldn't go into them unless you were well, that's where the men's go i guess they just crack beers in there and you know like, <laughs> and you know escape the doldrums of uh, domestic life i don't know but I should, I, I should start sharing some projects Hold on, I wanna I wanna ask you about one in particular here. No, you hold on, Mister. You hold on, Mister. I hold all the keys. I'm gonna burn this interview to the oh, ground. No. You're like the dungeon master. I'm gonna have a <laughs> since I lost this. I, I can't help but say this all the time. Kura, Kurosawa, it's called. Which is kind I've of never weird. known how to pronounce that because it reminds me of my um, one of my favorite directors, Akira Kurosawa. So I yep. can that's a classic. It. Are yeah, you in a, like Criterion the, movies. Yeah, oh, he's Seven Samurai is awesome. So, what do you want to know about this one? So, I haven't bought this one yet. I don't know if you even have prints or just the original, but um, I love this one. Oh, thank and you. And I'm I'm curious, like, what your like how it came about. What was the story behind it? What this guy on the left might be thinking. I don't know if you think about that when you're painting it. Um, I think the main story of that was just the volcano. Bowl. I'd seen a volcano, you know, when you see a volcano bowl go off and they sprinkle, what do they sprinkle on cinnamon or whatever? And it kind of flash, you know, there's kind of a, a weird kind of magic in that, uh, in tiki bars. And so what I did was um, I wanted to kind of envision what the spirit of the drink would be. And so I kind of went with like the multiple arm kind of shtick and stuff like that. And I like the fact he's looking down at the guy on the left. He's kind of addressing him a little bit, you know. Um, Such a good idea. When I, so when I looked at this, I saw this guy on the right. Okay, and to uh -huh. me, it's like this is the the uh, diehard tiki fan, right? Yeah, Who's like obsessed with bars. He's been a thousand times, um, and he's bringing someone that maybe hasn't been to the tiki bar a lot, and yeah. they're kind of like that could uh, be. <laughs> that could be actually, yeah. How funny! I like the fact there's other guys coming out of it, almost like it's a Pandora's bowl, you know. And all of a sudden, they don't know quite, you know, what they unleash during this. I like to leave it up a lot of times where I'll have a specific story, but two little side stories. And so I'll just, um, you know, kind of throw those in there and see if they work together and then just leave it and let let the viewer kind of, you know, kind of view it. Do you when you when you think about like the tiki's out tiki's outside of your pictures, like a lot of your tiki's almost have like a malevolent um I don't want to say malicious, but mischievous yeah. kind of element to them. Do you think that they are like trouble causers or do you think that yeah. they're more like just more like people? They're more like people, but then sometimes they're self portraits because I'm a little bit of a prankster and, prankster. Bit, <laughs> you know, so I like to have that attitude. Plus, I mean, you know, um, I found long ago, and especially as you get older, you just don't take stuff as seriously. You know, you kind of learn to laugh at, at what life gives you. You know what I mean? 
you get you get a lighter aspect of that. And I think that reflects in the work, you know, of the artist. I think I think an artist's personality sometimes can't help but uh, drool off into the painting, you know. Hundred percent. Uh, all right, all right. You've earned your you've earned your slide. What what slide do you yeah, want? <laughs> I want to pay tribute to some friends that I've been working on stuff with and some businesses and stuff. Let's so, do it. Let's look at number P. P is not a number, Ken. Okay. <laughs> this is uh, the cool ghoul for Frankie's 14th anniversary, which will be in December. This so, looks absolutely insane. So I wanted to do a Grim Reaper. Actually, the original name was Jin Reaper, which I thought was awesome, but um, Moss said name him cool ghoul so whatever but I, <laughs> besides being disappointed with the the name of him i love him and i can't show you the actual photo of him but he turned out brilliant and i'll be custom ah. eight or nine of them and selling those uh middle december after the opening but there's going to be a mug signing and opening there so that's for frankie's in las vegas i okay. think so frankie's like there's always this question about your favorite tiki bar i think my favorite tiki bar is frankie's tiki room See, I've never been there yet. Oh, really? Yeah. I think it's mostly because um, Doug and, and Tom and I believe Bamboo Ben did it. Some bars you go into the bars and it's like they just wanted to make a tiki experience, but they didn't necessarily like want to look into who's important in tiki. And it, it shows that they're not necessarily doing it out of love. They're doing it maybe from a more commercial perspective. And when I step into Frankie's Tiki Room, it's like, you know, the cocktails, depending on who makes them, sometimes they're good, sometimes they're not. But it doesn't really matter to me because you can tell that that bar was made with love and it was made with passion. And you look at the pictures and you're like, that's Tom Laura. I love Tom Laura. That's Doug Horn. I love Doug Horn. That's Crazy Al's Tiki. So you got to get some of your art in Frankie's Tiki Room, man. What's that? You got to get some of your art in Frankie's Tiki Room. I have a piece in there. You do? Well, it's just lackluster compared to Tom's iconic Ruby's Dilemma. I mean, that's a gorgeous piece. You know, that, boom. You know what I mean? He nailed it there. Yeah, he had They put a light on it, too. So I just have like... a shrunken head of uh, moss, and then there was a little hut in the background. But it's just, it's in the back and stuff like that. I would love to redo a different piece and give it to Moss to replace the other one. Because the other one was kind of, I don't know. You know, I just wasn't 100% satisfied with it. But Tom's nailed it. And, and Al's Tiki nails it and stuff. Yeah, I can't wait to go there finally and experience it all. Maybe vomit outside back or something, you know. <laughs> or, or yeah, it's going to be fun. Okay, next one, next one. And I, I got permission from all the people to do it, to, to share these. Okay, let's look at Q. This is okay. what I'm doing with, um, with Tiki Farm that um, we just picked out the glaze, so it should be hitting in about a um, couple months. And this one's called Maldano. I wanted to do one based on like Carl Malden's nose because <laughs> I love I love Carl Malden and love him, love him. But you know, I mean, I'm, you know, he's like Charles Nelson Rally to me. I'm fascinated by those guys. Anyway, this is a Maldano. Look at that nose. And, uh, he's a fun little guy. And then on the back is going to be this little dimensional freeze of like a waterfall and a river with some little masts and stuff like that. And Oh man, I, I saw the sculpt and I'm not going to share that, but this, this thing is going to look gorgeous when you get it. All right. Next that looks one. So good. It looks like your, it looks like your art on a mug. Yeah. Well, that's kind of what it is. Derp. Derp, 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 derp. <laughs> Sometimes it doesn't translate. It's, it's <laughs> hard. To, it's hard to take a painting and put it on a mug and have it actually translate. Well, I found I prefer people to hand sculpt my uh, art as opposed to doing it in a computer. I get much better results um, from that. Unless it's Thor. Thor is incredible, whatever he touches. He's like King Midas. All right. <laughs> anyway, next one, R. This R. one I'm very proud of. It almost looks like a menu. Is it a menu? No. If you look at the sides, you see on the sides how it curves like that? Yes. This is going to be like a scroll mug. So it's basically oh, a wow. It's going to be, it's loosely based, or at least in, I should say inspired by a cover of bias and his huge murals where he'd have like the island, mm -hmm. he'd have all the different huts or he'd have the different tiki's. Remember those? Are you familiar with him? Yep. It's, it's in the book of tiki and the, when you open up the page, that's his, that's cover of bias. He's a brilliant artist, but 
I decided to try something like that. And it'd be kind of fun just for people who, you know, really like all aspects of Tiki to be able to, you know, look at them all in one spot. I had to cram them a little bit, but they're all kind of um, along the right um, longitude, I think. Yep. It, it's really hard because when you look at an actual map of like Oceanic, it's all over islands the or Polynesia. There's yeah. there's small islands and they're sp spread way out. So if you did it like geographically accurate, you'd be looking at blue ocean. Exactly, exactly. Well, that's that one. That one's going to be called Discovery. I just is uh, that going to be um is that going to be like a fired on decal or is it going to be like car? No, no. The, um, the islands and the the tiki's themselves are all going to be dimensional, so they're going to be the size of like gummy bears. Okay. So they're going to pop up. And then I think we're going to do it with maybe an aqua base and kind of just rubbed really lightly. And then we're going to go in there with like a sepia and um, do a rub and a wipe or wipe it off. So it just kind of recesses in the different areas. Love yeah, I'm looking forward to this one a lot. How many so, of these islands have you been to? Uh, just the Hawaiian islands. Okay. Tom wants to go to Easter Island and thinks we can crowdfund our trip, but I don't think that many people like us. <laughs> so we're in these conflicts about that. You'd be surprised. Anyway, next, one, next one is for a place called Lazy Harry's. It's very, I'm going to be very mysterious about it. It's in the Southwest uh, desert. It's going to be opening next year. It's on mm. stilts, which is kind of cool. It's uh, near a body of water. Yeah. Let's just say it's near, it's near, it's near some kind of water. And, um, there's some lore about it because it's an older bar um, and there's supposedly like a body buried underneath it, which is kind of <laughs> cool. So anyway. So, so this, this older bar is being renovated into a tiki bar? Is that what you're saying? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I don't, say. I don't want to be buried out in the desert. Anyway, no, um, the clients are wonderful, wonderful people. And this is their first kind of bar and I guess it was passed down and so they're really working on this and making it so wonderful and so I've been helping them with their logo and stuff like that and this is actually not the final one but this is in development of it but I wanted to give it a nautical vibe on the left and as you turn it around it goes to an explorer vibe so you see like maps compasses um, nets you see um, binoculars a little pith helmet down there a little Papua New Guinea shield you know, all this kind of neat little stuff. So, um, so is this going to be a mug as well? Yes. So I saw the sculpt for it and it looks brilliant, but I can't share it because I don't uh. want to. So sorry. Oh. Okay. Next thing. Um, I got to do some, uh, tea. Tea would be the one. These are my friends at the bamboo club in long beach. They commissioned me to do, um, little vignettes for their drinks. And so, um, I'm actually going to be doing their menu too. I just talked to Jim a couple of weeks ago. And so I'm actually going to be working on the menu and we're going to be using these little cute vignettes for it. I also want to possibly do a, a tropical print with this. I think it would be really cool. Just flop them all around like conversation piece kind of. So anyway, that's you mean for like an Aloha shirt kind of deal. Yeah. Not a tropical print for your couch. No, would sit on that <laughs> or a pillow. No. I love the, uh, the zombie one because he's coming out of the ground. And I love the Lapu Lapu one. There's a zombie. Yeah, Lapu Lapu one is great because it has that little Castilian helmet and then that scimitar, that Filipino scimitar. So you know what happened next, you know, kind of thing. Okay, anyway, next thing. Let's go to the Inferno Room. Have you ever been to the Inferno Room in Indianapolis? I have not yet. I hear oh, amazing things. Oh, geez, that's incredible. They basically have an anthropologist estate sale stuff um, there. They basically just bought the whole estate sale and went in there. But they have been, they've been having me do menus. So here's the menu right here. And what is that? Is that you one? Let's see you. This is you. Okay, that's you. Okay, that's one of the menus I did for them based on some surrealistic uh, cocktail of uh, Polynesian delights painting I had done. Let's see. Uh, U1 would be another good one. Let's see. U1. Yeah, they've been working a lot, um, them and I. I, I love doing um, a bunch of their stuff. They're just so fun to brainstorm with, and I wanted to give them a shout. Oh, there's the actual painting. 
we had surrealism in one of our gargantua categories. And so this was uh, the, Polyn the cocktail of Polynesian delights, uh, a riff on um, little uh, Hieronymus Bosch there with his uh, gardens of earthly delights. And so there's just, so much going on in this one, Ken. Yeah, it's crazy. It's I think it's the piece is three by three feet. And if you want to buy it, PM me because I still have it. And it's gorgeous. Anyway, let's go to you two. Not the band, please. <laughs> There's uh, another menu I had done for them earlier, their first menu, which is very fun. But I just wanted to share that because it doesn't get much play and it's a really good menu. Okay, you three. That is art for their zombie glass. I got to do a zombie Ooh. glass for them. Is that one already out? I'll pull you up. Yes. That's already out and it's there. And I think if you order a zombie, you get that. Oh, here. Can people see? Oh, here. Where is it? Yeah, there it is. And it, as you can see, they all have that red skin like the Aseki um, jerky guy. So they're like kind of zombied. Okay. I love looking at these. So that is that that's a 360 degree wrap. Yeah. I always look for the uh oh the, yeah. right here, the color gap. It's I'm kinda, obsessed with color gaps. <laughs> oh, kind of obvious on the on the actual printed one, but for the print I adjusted it. <laughs> so it didn't look like I'm gonna Yeah, I did one for them and I did one for Hidden Harbor too. And I I think I finally got it down where you have one color going over that area with the, with a gap, but then you do your other color with the gap over here, you know. You know, you do one, one with the gap over here and then one with the gap over here, you know, so that way the gaps don't overlap and it's not as noticeable. And it's kind of yeah. hidden. For, you know, for people don't watching, when you print a glass, a lot of glassware companies won't actually uh, print 360 degree wraps because there, I believe the machine has to hold the glass in a certain part so it can only print, you know, a certain yeah, amount of degrees a around the glass. Inch, a quarter inch gap. So if you if you want to get rid of that gap, you have to do it with colors. So you you make it print the colors in different different locations, different degrees around the glass. So when you see a three sixty degree wrap, you kind of have to. If you know what you're looking for, you look for where there's a color missing. So in this case, this is that brown or red um, is missing from this panel right here. Right here, yeah, right there. That one at least was it. Yeah, the Hidden Harbor one. Um it was so detailed. That's why, you know, I'm, I'm learning not to do such detail on these glasses. <laughs> but you know what? We can send someone to the freaking Mars, right? We can send someone to the moon. We're almost sending people to Mars. Why the heck can't we figure <laughs> out freaking, freaking glasses? You know what I mean? Jeez. I don't know of that many people that will do it. I, there's Culture Cove, South Pacific Promotions. That's the only one I know of. Oh, Mean uh, Gene McDonald does too. Who, who is it? Mean Gene McDonald. He makes us call him Mean, mean Gene, Gene McDonald. Okay. So we can all mean kick Gene. your ass. I'm talking to you, G. We can all kick your ass, buddy. Yeah. Dude, that, is, that is one angry, <laughs> is it an alligator or a crocodile? I'm not yeah, an expert, but man, he's got bite. Yeah, I'm actually planning. I think I'm going to be doing their five-year anniversary mug. Um, we've been discussing that, so. It might involve a crocodile. I don't know. We'll see. Okay, let's look at me. These two things I don't have permission to show, so I hope they don't oh. get mad at me. But I'm going to share them anyway because I'm just so excited about them. And you know what? You do something really nice and you can't share it, and it's like, fuck. You know, why can't I share it? Well, it's entirely Ken's fault if if these weren't supposed to be shown. <laughs> there you go. Go for it. I think Chris and Ed will forgive me. They're good. What They're am I showing you? You are showing number V. Number V and then uh, I think R1 after that. Okay. Mm. Yeah, on the left is a hoodie design I'm doing for them. And the uh, little figures on the bottom, the River Sticks guys, I'm actually going to be uh, doing as a mural on their back fence next year. And then if you look to your right, we're going to be doing a tropical shirt. So uh, there you go. That thing is gorgeous. It has little elements, uh, nice bright colors like Chris likes. But there you go. Okay. Now show R1. Is that R1 or V1? R1. Is that? Let me see. Come on, Gabe. 
I don't know if I have that one. Oh, you don't have R1? How about V1? Is there a V1? There's no V1 or R1. Oh, well. Okay, let's see. Um, let's see number H. Because I'm going to show you guys a tutorial really quick on that black suede velvet if you want. Let's do it. Okay, this piece, I'm going to show you a couple of the steps I do when I do this piece. Okay, let's see H1. That's what I do first. I sketch it out with white pastel pencil onto the thing. And this one, I kind of just winged it. I did a couple sketchbooks, really fast sketches, but then I just winged it, and it turned out okay, so I, I stopped it right there. What's okay, the material that you're drawing on? Black suede matte board. The stuff that's much more forgiving. I call it poser velvet. <laughs> okay, let's see H2. Then you start applying color to it. So you figure out where your light was, which was the torch at the top. And then you just kind of work your lighting around there. See how that works? That's the part that screws with your brain because you're doing it backwards. Okay, let's see U4. And there it is right there with, with some more, with, with a subtle color that's going to be reflected off the walls and off the water, that kind of uh, olive kind of green. And then do I have a U5 or not? If not, just show you again. Yeah, there we go. Ta-da. And that's what it ended up. I just added some white. But it's just layers, layers, layers. I hope a, a little new generation of people will try out this uh, medium. Woody Miller hooked me up with this because I was asking, okay. you do such beautiful, luminous um Velvets, I go, I play with velvet and I suck. I played that board. And so, boom, that was that. Okay, cool. We got rid of those ones. Oh, here, did you guys know I also, I wood burn too? It's called pyrography. Pyrography? Do we yeah. have a slide of that? Yeah, you do. It's um, I. I. There it is right there. This one's called Listening to the Waterfall. He's listening to the waterfall in the back. And then I so think, I, oh, go ahead. How do you go about doing one of these? I sketch it out really lightly in pencil. Then I would burn the black line, which would be U1, if you want to show that. I think I, I, think I shared a shot of that. Ta-da. Yeah, and that's after I had uh, wood burned it all in there. So if you look at it really close, and then I just erased the pencil, and that's all just wood burning. What's fun is I got a coal wood wood burner from a dear friend, uh, Jonesy, and um, man, I can I can it has a little dial on it, and you can adjust it to like seven or eight, and basically it's like sketching instead of. You know, with a regular wood burn, you're like, you're sitting there and you're struggling and, you know, you're waiting and you're waiting and you're waiting, you know, and it's just horrible. You know, it's, it's you know, whereas this stuff, you can just have your nice sweeping strokes if you get it at the right temperature. So, um, yeah, I've gotten better and better at it. But then after I do this, I uh, put a light sealant on it and then I just uh, do washes of acrylic in there. And that turns out really nice. Oh, I wanted, to give a, I wanted to give a shout out to Sunken Studios in Ohio. I'm working on a mug for them, but they never return my calls as to whether or not I can. <laughs> but the mug is awesome, and it's a twist on an old classic that is going to blow your mind. Yeah, I'm also working on a three-vessel set based on hornbills and alligators. That should be released soon uh, through Undertow. And we did one that was a Collins-sized cup. Then we did one that was the size of a drinking cup and one that was like one of those uh, onion bottles. Remember those from the old um, sailors back in the day? They'd have the onion bottle and it had like a big base like this on the bottom. Oh, okay. Yep. Yeah. Why do they call them an onion bottle? I don't know. They I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. They make a little terrarium and grow onions. Someone tell know. us in the comments why they're called an onion barrel. I don't know, but what? The but they like to have a good story, Undertow does. And so the, the story was was that one of the artists on the ship went to these different villages in Papua New Guinea and commissioned these uh, different different uh, drinking vessels. And they did it all inspired with uh, crocodiles and with hornbills. And so um, yeah, I just wanted to plug them because that will be out soon too, next year. And I'm doing 
three mugs and one bowl with Tiki Land Trading. So that was, that was my bus stop next year because we started talking about glazes. You've been a busy man. I think I covered everybody. I know, but it doesn't feel like I'm busy. That's why I paint so much. So I have something to show. So it doesn't look like I'm a lazy ass. <laughs> yeah. You know, you're like posting on Instagram. Oh, I haven't shared any art in like a week. Let me post these eight different things I've done. <laughs> yeah. But I think I'm, uh, let me see. Oh, we have, we have a few more things to share. Um, some art. Let if me, you want to talk about art. Yeah. Let, let me do a giveaway real quick. Oh, sure. Let's do a giveaway. What you giving away? Yeah, we're we're gonna do cool. a Black Lagoon Rum. So we got a pin from the Black Lagoon Rum by Pete Clockout. It was a shrunken and head. It's a shrunken head. So we're going to give away this pin from the Black Lagoon Rum. We're also going to give away one of their swizzle sticks. The, the Black Lagoon Rum. Ah. I can get that to focus. Maybe. Eh, focus for a second. So in order to get this, if you were listening earlier, this Legendary Realms Bowl was made by four people uh the three returning gargantuas ken ruzik tom big toe laura and doug horn and then there was a fourth guest who worked on one of the pillars of the legendary realms bowl the first person to type that artist in the comments uh will get to take home a black lagoon rum pin nice oh here kimmy livingston said the bulbous shape resembles an onion so thank you okay <laughs> oh, here's a good one. I love that. That is so funny. Yep. So we're getting a lot of answers. Um, some of them are not correct. So a bunch of people guessed McBiff. McBiff worked on the night of the the um night of night, the night marchers. This one he worked on. Here's his little guy right here. Yeah. So McBiff worked on that one, but this is the Legendary Realm. So it was not McBiff. Yeah, um, you, we yeah. did get the correct answer. So Chris Gaw. Oh, yeah. Uh, Susie. Yeah. yeah, so Atomic Kitty. Uh, Susie Moser. Congratulations, uh, Chris Gaw. You're taking home Black Lagoon Room pin and a swizzle stick. And those for, for those uh, who don't know, Atomic Kitty is an amazing artist. She actually did a lot of the little corner illustrations on Smuggler's Cove. So most people watching this, you probably have a copy of Smuggler's Cove. The recipe book, if you look at the little corner pages, those illustrations were done by Atomic Kitty. She also has some products awesome. in Tiki Land Trading. So does uh, Doug and Tom. They have some artwork and stuff on there, too. I can't wait to see all of this stuff. I saw Doug Horns. He's got like a SS Minnow coming with Tiki Land Trading. That looks pretty cool. Yeah. Oh, where do you see mine? Mine are going to blow. Mine are going to make all theirs look like crap, like a, like a poop. Ken, you're not supposed to do that. They are so awesome, Doug. The no, secret to success, Ken. Low expectations. Doug, I'm going to kick your ass, Doug. <laughs> Tom, Tom, buddy. Yeah. No, we're getting all hyped up for the Gargantua show, man. It's an art battle. Okay, so who would win in a boxing match? Oh, Three-way yeah. boxing match. Yeah, you, Doug Horn, and Tom. You ask all four artists, and they'll all give you the answer. And it, it's spelled M E. That's how they would all answer. <laughs> no, Doug, I think we can topple. I think if Tom and I, you know, if it was like a cage match, Tom and I could probably get some ropes around Doug's arms and pull him down, like, you know, Gulliver's travel style. You can yeah. strategize. So I think the only way either of you are getting out of this is if you team up in the beginning and take out Doug first. Yeah. And then James Owen, he has a hat. So that's easy to kick anyone's ass with a hat, you know? You knock their hat off. What they can't do it. Yeah, what you do is you knock it off, and while they're paying attention to that, is when you just go in. You know. Yeah, but between Tom and I, I don't know because Tom and I both, I think, would play dirty. You know. Uh oh. We definitely have some uh, great banter. You know, we definitely have some great hurl great insults at each other, like miscreant and you know words like that. You know. Tom <laughs> said uh, we can put his comment up here. Toe for sure. Toe for sure. Yeah. You think, See? oh, sure, for sure, whatever. whatever. <laughs> Angela, tough call. Shut up. Shut up. <laughs> we, scared, well, we scared the crap out of Doug uh, in Hawaii. Tom and I were um, quite imbibed. We were quite um, quite uh, buzzed. And um, we kept on telling Doug when we got back, because we, we had been vending that day with um, Tiki Shark, and um, we had a show or a festival or something, but we were driving back. 
from having drinks after that. And we kept on telling Doug we were just going to kick his ass. We were just like, you know, playing along, but he started to take us seriously. So as soon as he got home, he freaking locked the door to his bedroom because he was. Like, <laughs> and so we just took it further and started banging on the door, going, Doug, you fucking, you know, want to taste your blood, you know, all this kind of stuff. <laughs> yeah, but I think Doug knows we could probably kick his ass, you know. How did you guys first meet? Let's see. I first saw Doug at the Catalina Island Tiki Fest, but I was scared of him because he was so big. And it was like my first Tiki event. Um, Holden sponsored it. It was really fun. Um, but yeah, I just kind of didn't talk to him because I was just kind of, I don't know, I'm socially awkward. So I've gotten a little bit better over the years, but I just kind of didn't talk to him and until later. But I met Tom when I was working on three mugs with Holden when I first started. And... Um, he, had, he said, I came over there, I guess, to check on glazes or some shit or something. And he had two paintings up there. And he's like, hey, there's this guy I want you to meet. I think you two would get along. You guys are both fucking weirdos. And uh, it was Big Toe's paintings right there. And then we met and that was it. You know, then then all of a sudden Doug was right there and and boom. You know, who, who worked with Holden first? Did you work with Holden first or Tom? I think Doug did. Doug did? Doug's the grand old man. He's like 80 or something, I think. He's really old. 80. I didn't realize he lived next to Crazy Al. He was one of our guests last yeah. year. Yeah, in fact, uh, we, we do art jams sometimes where we'll all get together and just have uh, create art, get drunk, and watch exploitation movies and rag on each other or rag on our patrons or whatever, you know. And um, we used to do it at the studio, and then after COVID, we started doing it over at Doug's house because it was outside, and that way, you know, it was all in the fresh air. And since Al lives out back, yeah, it was fun because you could see it, Doug and Al at the same time. It was pretty awesome. He was telling me stories. He would just like look out his window and there would be Al in the backyard carving with his chainsaw, you know, oh, yeah. the way Al does in typical Al fashion. Well, it would be cool if like they had a bunch of apartments there and just all only artists occupied it. It'd be great to have a little community like that. It would be kind of cool. It'd be too powerful. Yeah. So nobody had an embarrassing story or, or a weird story from Oasis. Like yesterday, remember when you were asking? Them? Yeah. Oh, oh, I don't know. I've always had a lot of weird stuff. In fairness, I don't know how many of those stories I would repeat online. Really? <laughs> it's kind of like what the like the what happens at Oasis stays at Oasis, right? Oh. <laughs> I got a few funny ones. I guess I'll have to tell them to you in person. Oh, hey, I went to the doctor last week for a physical. I, I basically said, "Hey, doc, you know, I'm I'm kind of self conscious about my weight." And so you know what the doctor told me? He said, Ken, take off all your clothes. So I took off all my clothes. He's like, get on all fours. So I'm like, okay. So I get on all fours and I'm sitting there and my my little fat belly's hanging out. And I'm not, this is not helping me with my, you know, self-consciousness about my weight. He's like, he grabs a little notepad and he's like, okay, Ken, I want you to go and crawl over to that wall over there. So I crawl over to that wall and he takes these notes. He's like, good, good, good. Ken, I want you to crawl over in front of that desk over there. So I crawl in front of the desk and he's looking at me. He's like, okay, interesting, interesting. And he's like, oh, Ken, I want you to crawl over to that planner over there. So I crawl over to the planner. He's like, okay, that's good, good, good. And I'm like, well, what's this all about? This doesn't help me at all with, you know, my, my, my self-consciousness or my physical or anything. And the doc looks up from his pad and he says, well, this isn't about that. I'm getting a couch tomorrow. I want to see where I'm going to put it. Come on. Where, where's your... <laughs> okay. You know, Ken, if... Oh, for anyone watching, none of you are getting your money back. No. <laughs> I am not paying $5 to anyone for Ken's terrible jokes. <laughs> I go back to that same doctor a year later. I'm like, doctor, I'm here for my physical. He's like, okay, Ken, get naked. Because I guess he likes to see me naked, right? So I get naked. He's like, walk over to that window over there. So I walk over to the window. He's like, stick your tongue out. So I stick my tongue out. Do that for about three minutes. He's like, okay, turn around. Let's get your physical going. And I'm like, well, what was that all about? Was that about my physical? And doctor goes, no, I just hate my neighbors. <laughs> I have a talking dog one, but that one takes five minutes to tell. So I don't know if I should tell that one. I don't know, Ken. I think I think maybe you should stick to the art. Jeez. You were, <laughs> you were, you were <laughs> in the mirror and we're waiting all night to say that. 
you weren't going to laugh in the beginning at all. Once I said the five dollar thing, you got all Mister Cheapy with your Yo, lap. Oh, yeah. Man, I'm calling you the carpet right now, Gabe. I like my money, Ken. No. <laughs> No, I found that when you do promo for events and stuff like that, if you put a little lie in there, it sounds sensational. That if people yeah. believe it, they deserve what they get when they realize that it's not true. You know, like we promise. I think you're the. You may be the king of sensationalism, with your gargantua advertisements. <laughs> oh, those guys are so nice. So I mean, I love, I love that I found Doug and Tom because they're just wonderful human beings. They've taught me so much. I mean, we we get along seamlessly like brothers and we fight like brothers. I mean, it's just great. So I'm, I'm feel really blessed to have that, you know, that going because they're kind of cool. You know, I'll give them a, I'll give them a little yeehaw right now. I think they deserve a yeehaw. Yeehaw. They each got their own yeehaw. Yeah. I got to visit. Oh, you want <laughs> more pictures before we go? I got We got a few yeah. more to look at. Okay. Number F the night drummers. Let's look at some art for all these people who are probably bored. Like, oh, no more jokes. Show me the art. Michael. I want to say hi to Michael. That's Angela's husband, and, she, and he is so much radder than her. This one's called, I think, the offbeat of the night drummers. I think it's called the offbeat. Yeah, you know when you're like drumming along with someone or getting into the rhythm, and all of a sudden, you know, you you, you get off a little bit. That's yep. why I wanted this piece to picture because no one really painted stuff like that. So I figured that's a fun little situation. And I, I love that awkward feeling and sometimes the looks you get from people. And that was it. And that one's also painted on a, on blue suede mat board. They have a variety of colors. Okay. So the method is still the same. It's just the, the color that you're starting with is different. Yeah. It's just that you have to adjust from very, very dark in your head to the medium grade lighting of the blue. Yeah. How do you fix mistakes when you're going backwards? I don't make mistakes. You don't make mistakes. <laughs> I no. don't know. Tom, do you agree with that statement? <laughs> you throw it away a lot of times or I'll put it away. I have a little pile of, of pieces, probably about four inches thick of like drawings that just weren't cutting it. But sometimes you can go back later. Maybe you've acquired some skill in those six months since that piece and, and then you go back to that piece and then repair it or save it. Or if not, I just keep it in a little pile of shame, you know, a pile of shame. Yeah. Yeah. Heck yeah. All right. Let's see. Next one. G. G. Yo, G. This one's called the night rowers and this one's based on the night marchers um, kind of with their, the Hawaiian soldiers had those gourd helmets. So I just decided to stylize them so they look more like skulls. So that's kind Is of this a I, new one? Yeah. Is it still available? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, in fact, it's back here. Look in the background. Back here. It's right here. here. I'll bring it. I'll show it to you. I'll prove to you, mister. Let's see it. Let's do a plug. Where do people buy these things? You can buy this on Etsy. And look. It's, there you uh, it's, go. It doesn't really show you, but the, the green on there glows neon. You remember I was talking about, about like taking a subject matter and then kind of just redoing it and redoing it? Yep. I tried to do some more grim ones for Halloween, like that River Sticks one and then this one. But then I'm also working on uh, teeny ones, too, that I also have for sale on the Etsy page, like this one right here. Hi, everybody. Called the Cannibal King's Ooh. Night, and that one also is uh, UV activated too on the green part, I think. Yeah, but you can't see it on the computer screen; it doesn't pick up fluorescence. But is I have the a Cannibal real... King your favorite? Yeah, and I think um, a lot of people don't know this, but the Cannibal King is. Um, I really wanted to put him into that kids' book story, and I wanted his story to be basically that he was just crabby and. And, and a rascal because he was so lonely because he was a cannibal and eventually he just ate all of his friends. And you see analogies of that. Like when I was in the um, LA, when I was showing in LA a lot during the nineties and stuff, you could see that happening a lot. You could see people just eating their friends and using, you know, using their different levels of status and stuff like that, you know, in order to gain more for them, like in this cannibalism thing. So I've always liked that, that cannibal theme, you know, cause it's a, you know, Screwing over people is, you know, another necessary thing in the human condition. And so, you know, not many people approach stuff like that. You know, like, 
like you see some early, what were some of those Dutch masters who were doing like the card cheats or the pickpockets and stuff like that. You know, I like to capture little, little seamy sides of um, just the world and people, you know, and, and sometimes I'll do ones like that, but the cannibal King, I've always liked him for that. Cause he's just crab ass, you know? He's genius. He's, yeah. He's just, just sad, sad yeah. and depressed. <laughs> Well, on a lighter note, let's look at K and L. K and L. Yeah, come on, kids. This is a hornbill mask, and then I did a crocodile mask. So it's the hornbill style from Papua New Guinea? Yeah. It's it's Polynesian, too. I mean, there's hornbills all over the place around there, speckled here and there and stuff like that. But I don't know if this, if this style of hornbill with it up at the, at the top of the upper beak if that one is exclusive to Papua New Guinea or not. But, you know, I think I can get away with the whole excuse of just, you know, you have the the classical Polynesia and then you have the polypop kitsch part of it where you can kind of play and take different elements, you know. If someone can do a creature from the Black Lagoon Tiki, I can definitely put the wrong hornbill in a mask. Yep. <laughs> I always, like, whenever I see the... I think the two things for me, so you got the like the hornbills here on the side and then the tongue, the tongue sticking out with the little uh, triangles back and yep. forth. There it always says uh, PNG to me. Did you notice the bird's body too going down? The bird's body? They're like perched. No, like right here? Yeah. And there's a the little side. thing and then there's a little, little legs. Little legs. Hi, little legs. Okay. Oh, yeah. this one, uh, yeah. L. That's the crocodile line. That one I love the colors on. Yeah, these two got sold uh, at Oasis, but I'm doing. I did two smaller versions that are on my Etsy page, different colorways, and they're UV activated. So how's that for a plug? Okay, let's look at uh, let's look at two pieces I just sold in the past few weeks. Let's look at M, the unexpected passenger. So people cannot buy this one, or are you going to do prints? I'm going to do prints eventually, but you're going to have to wait. Anyway, this one is fun because. Um, it's kind of a comedy of errors. These people um, basically escape their island, which is, uh, you know, being um, overcome by volcanic lava and ash and everything else. But only one of them is starting to notice that they've taken an unexpected passenger along. So it's kind of a little bit of a, a dark story that where the ending of the story is more in the future of your brain, bringing it to that conclusion, as opposed to actually being, you know, pictured there you know of their doomed voyage so that was kind of a fun little grim one and then i have another one that's n that i just did that as might become a series right there and this one is called a uh, search right, for the bird it. king and this one's kind of part of that whole storybook narrative i have but these little guys right here are going through this little jungle path and they're looking for the king of the birds basically because they want to speak with him about something and I'll let the viewer decide whatever they want to speak with him. But they meet two of his little uh, escorts. What do you call those? Um, uh, there's some royal term for escorts. I forgot what it was called. Oh, well, no one would know. Anyway, I think we got through all the pictures though. I love um, it, dude. How more I, oh, wait, one more W here's a drawing that I think I might have for sale on Etsy or I'm going to put it up there. But it's a spirit hook in that Papua New Guinea style. And it's a hospitality spirit hook. See, so he has a little bowl in his hands. He's a little praying. He's got a little happy little prayerful play for you. He's yeah. got the multi multiple hands going here again. Yeah, holding on. A little pineapple bowl. Do you know why they have spirit hooks in uh, Papua New Guinea? I do not. They're actually also called suspension hooks. What they do is they hang their their food up there in nets so the rats don't get them. Okay. Yeah, they're um, most of the time they're female, but I make mine male and female. And I decided to add wings on this guy just because he's hospitable. He needs to fly from to and fro, you know, helping people out when he wants. Kind of like a superhero. A little, little friend up there in the corner. Yeah, a little hornbill, get it? And there's little cowrie shells for his necklace. Yeah, just fun little things like that. I think help authenticate it or at least show you the source where I got it. Yep. So it's not that I'm, you know, really um, stealing from it, but I'm trying to reinterpret it through that whole lens of contemporary tiki, which is, um, you know, a lot of kitsch, a lot of enjoyment and escapism. 
and a lot of uh, colliding of different worlds, you know, especially these days when you have Star Wars tiki's, Creature from the Black Lagoon tiki's, you know, it's like, come on, you know, it's like trying to figure out um, a stable world for that. So that's kind of what I did with him. I do agree that there's like, I, I don't necessarily, I'm not a tiki purist by any means. I, and I don't have a problem necessarily with Star Wars tiki's or anything, but I do think that there's such like a rich landscape of stuff within Oceania that that uh, sometimes it's not even really necessary to be pulling from these non non related things because there's yeah that's my cat sorry <laughs> he, he showed up last night too he, he shows up at the end I guess oh right on yeah <laughs> mine's a lazy ass she has naps all day in the corner she won't even come out He's, he's very social as soon as I start talking on the phone and otherwise he doesn't care. But if he hears me talking and he doesn't understand who's on the other side. Oh, um, oh hello, can... hello, Brandy. I'm reading the little uh, comment. <laughs> hello, Brandy. Yeah, my friend Angela, um, she brought her sister over once to the studio and she was very, very sweet. And Roxanne is here. I love Roxanne. She's the greatest, coolest chick. Look at all these people who are here. Wow. Feel like they it's all a, came to see you, Ken. A funeral or something. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Actually, you know, as much as I hate to do it, because I know this is about you, and you know, Tom's been talking smack in the comments all night. But we do have a Tom mug to give oh, away. Yeah, there's his hornbill, his attempt at a hornbill. It actually turned out to be a parrot. I'm gonna pull up the uh are you giving that away too? Yeah, we're going to announce the winner right now. What do you think? Oh, can I just have it? Can you just have it? I mean, you could, yeah. I think they're still yeah. available on tikifarm.com, but also you design mugs for Holden. So. I don't want to pay for it. I don't want to give Tom any money for it. Ask Holden. Yeah, true. Maybe. I think you yeah, could work something out. Us artists don't have as much influence as you think. <laughs> yeah. Speaking of Holden... Oh, our rum giveaways. And thank you, Plantation Rum. I love your dark rum. That was really, really good. And that Kurosawa you sent is yum. I had a shot of that, and it's doing the trick. It is so good. Um, and, Plantation uh, Rum makes a variety of different rums. Mugs anywhere. What was that? Oh, Tiki Farm is the world's largest manufacturer of tiki mugs anywhere. Holden Rum. Yes, it is. He's like James Brown. He's like the hardest working man in tiki. You know, that dude is always busy and in another country. He's crazy. They work so hard. And he's also huge props to Tiki Farm for making awesome mugs like this with all these colors, the glaze, the crazy, you know, the sculpt is amazing. And the design from Tom and it's at an affordable price, which cannot necessarily be said of a lot of the other Tiki Mark mugs on the market today. Um, Holden, I know, cares very deeply about tiki and mugs and the culture and and the people uh, that collect his mugs and uh you know i can't say enough good things about holden so thank you to holden for sponsoring me so oh, listen to the crickets so what's the question um for this guy win this win this beautiful big toe mug so they actually already entered and we already have the winner selected but i'm going to type it in right here so that people can find it easily. Yeah, Tom gets a commission if you buy if you buy the mug from Tiki Farm. So I suggest buying it bootleg somewhere. <laughs> bootleg. <laughs> I haven't seen a bootleg of this one yet. Um, Although every I think every Tom Lore design that has ever been made has been bootlegged. Oh, I know. It's sad the taste level in bootleggers, huh? <laughs> savage. <laughs> Absolutely savage. And on that note, we do have a winner. So the oh, winner, of, do you have a drum roll sound? Ken? Yes, I do actually. Give me one second. I'll find, oh, here it is. Here we go. Wait a second here. <laughs> Who wins? Ah, ah James. James Casey? Right. I don't know if I pronounced that right. C-A-S-S-L-E-Y. James Casey. Congratulations. You won. Congratulations. The party parrot mug. Ooh, James. James. If you can, send us a message if you see this with your address. Otherwise, we will contact you after 13 Nights at Tiki Frights, probably November 1st, uh, to get your address and everything. 
So congratulations to them. And Ken, it has been awesome having you. Uh, thank you so much for chatting with me. It's been uh, such a pleasure and a dream. Thank you. That was really fun. Yeah. That went really fast. It was an hour. I, oh, shit. We talked for an hour and a half. An hour and a half. I think this is the longest one yet. Wow. And it felt like yeah. only five minutes. Only five minutes. Yeah. And, I, you know, I'll just put it out there that I, I think you would win in a boxing oh, match. Oh, yeah. yeah. So, I'm gonna you know, the eyes. All well, the I'm people a in the comments saying, uh, Tom, I don't know. I'm in the Marine, though. I'm 82 to 86. I was in the Marines. So we learned some stuff that, oh, man. Oh, there you go. We can handle it. Maybe Tom will just throw his bootleg bugs at you, though. Well, I'm just going to pull out his little beard hairs one by one. <laughs> yeah, we'll see. Well, maybe when we have our Gargantua show next year, you should all attend, and maybe we'll have, like, a bum fight out in the back or something. A bum fight? Yeah. They're not that expensive, right? Hey, here's 20 bucks. Kick that guy's ass. That guy talked shit on your mom. You know, so you so don't like, even have to get involved. You're just going to have other people yeah, take out Tom. No, no. <laughs> we have those brittle bones now, you know, and all that stuff, you know. All right. That's all right. it, guys. Thank you so much for joining us. Follow Ken Ruzik on Instagram. Oh, yeah. right here. here we go. Here we go. Right here. A bunch of the art that you saw tonight is on sale on Ken Ruzik's uh, Etsy studio, and then he's got a bunch of other mugs coming out with Frankie's Tiki Room, Inferno Room, maybe. He's got some stuff coming out with Aloha shirts. Yeah, so we just about it. We're in labor and watch it again. You can, uh, you all can figure it out. Well, uh, thank you. Hey, that was really fun. Thanks so much, buddy. It has been a true pleasure having you on, and can't wait to see you again. And get Tom and Ted on here. You should get all three of us on there one time. So, Tom was here the first year, Doug Horn the second year. You're here the third year. So I think next year, round table. All I'll, the gloves are off. I'll contact you uh, right before our Gargantua show. Maybe we can do a little uh, Gargantua show promo and then discuss the show and share more flyers and stuff like that or share the artwork we have for it. 100%. Be awesome. I'd be down. Because they are my brothers. Cool, man. Thank you so much. Thanks for tuning in, guys. We'll see you hey. tomorrow. Hey. Thank you. Hey. Thank you. Hey. Thank you. Hey. Thank you.